Over the last 100 years, rates of cancer have steadily increased. Why is this the case if the human population is supposed to be improving through the process of natural selection? Is it because people are living longer and we are diagnosing more malignancy? The problem with that is that cancer rates have increased at ages well below any change of life expectancy. Is it because our environment is becoming more toxic to us, for example mobile phones, highly processed food, vaccinations, etc.? The problem with that is that it's not just environmentally related malignancy that has increased, but also genetically inherited related malignancies. Tackling this line of thought from another direction, is there any way to naturally select against genetically caused cancer and other diseases that only occur after reproduction? If a genetic abnormality predisposes to cancer only after reproduction, e.g. after the age of 40, then there is no obvious way that natural selection will be able to get rid of that predisposition. That is because the process of reproduction is not significantly affected by that particular mutation. In fact, virtually all genetically related disease that do not affect reproduction cannot be selected out. There are very few rare and seriously disabling conditions that will lead people to deliberately not reproduce. With time, as mutations continue in the human DNA, we would reasonably expect genetically related post-reproductive age disease to also increase. Let us take a closer look at the human genome and determine what mutations can and cannot be selected out. The human DNA has approximately 6 billion nucleotide positions, that is, two copies of 3 billion letters. Mutations occur all the time within this DNA library. It is accepted that the vast majority of the mutations would have to represent information loss. This is easily understood if one imagines random errors of letters within an encyclopedia. It should be self-evident that a random letter change in an encyclopedia would be highly unlikely to add useful information for the reader. The two essential questions are, does a downhill mutation, i.e. one that leads to information loss, have enough biological effect to be selected against? And does an uphill mutation, i.e. one that leads to complex and useful information gain, have enough biological effect to be selected for? It is estimated there are at a minimum 100 mutations, and some say 300, within the hereditary genome per person, per generation. Overall, humanity, 7 billion people, that would represent 700 billion mutations. It was once believed that they, many of these mutations would not matter as they occurred in non-coding, junk or evolutionary leftover DNA. With time, it is becoming increasingly clear that more and more of the so-called junk DNA is actively used. As we become aware of the intricate complexity of the DNA and how it functions, the term junk DNA is becoming less and less useful. The percentage of junk DNA has rapidly decreased from 97% a few decades ago. In 2005, it was known that at least 50% of the human genome was transcribed. In 2007, a consortium of genomic scientists under the name ENCODE has shown that virtually all of the genome is transcribed, most in both directions. That fraction of supposedly unused junk DNA is now negligible. Even if a mutation occurs in junk DNA, it takes up space, affects distances between other sites and can affect DNA folding. Therefore, no mutation can really be classified as completely neutral. Prior to this number being known, it was assumed that there must be less than one deleterious mutation per person per generation. This is logical, as more than one mutation per person per generation would mean that downhill mutations could never be removed from the population without decimating the population. If the average downhill mutational load is 100 per person, then there would be no way to select against downhill mutations. Long-term DNA degeneration seems certain, even if you consider 70% of the DNA to be junk. The contrary argument claims that given that these near-neutral downhill mutations are not selectable, then they would suffer from genetic drift and therefore be removed from the DNA. The phrase genetic drift may seem good, but it only hides what is an otherwise untenable position. To genetically drift 700 billion mutations per generation would be quite a feat. The number of 100 
nucleotide substitutions per generation is likely to increase when satellite mutations, deletions, duplications, insertions, inversions and translocations are all taken into account. This could take the number of abnormalities within the DNA to the thousands. The majority of these 100 mutations per person would likely result in a loss of information. However, this information loss is minuscule in the face of 6 billion data points in the DNA. The vast majority of downhill mutations, therefore, are not only going to have a small, a very small effect on biology. There are, however, some downhill mutations that have a large biological effect and would therefore be selected against quite quickly. For example, a mutation leading to prenatal death. The following mock example from a jet fighter instruction manual will help clarify this. Step 6. When you have completed the last step, go back and repeat step 3 until part B is 10.004 millimetres thick. Consider random misspellings in the above example. Most would just have a small effect on the clarity of the message. However, some changes could potentially be devastating, demonstrated by those underlined. While it may be conceivable that some misspellings may improve the jet fighter in its function, that would obviously be incredibly unlikely. There are also downhill mutations that are actually adaptive to an organism. This is best seen in bacteria where virtually all antibiotic resistant mechanisms are either due to information neutral or information loss genetic processes. For example, penicillin resistance is often caused by the loss of information within the bacteria to bind penicillin. As the genetic causes for adaptation are elucidated, it seems that the majority of adaptions are secondary to information neutral or loss mechanisms. In fact, many creationists claim that there is not one rock-solid known beneficial mutation that leads to a gain of information within the genomic library. This includes adaptations that seem to be designed rather than to have occurred by random mutations. A group of DNA letters forms a gene or a DNA sentence. However, that DNA sentence is not only read in one direction. The majority of DNA sentences are also read in a backwards direction. Different adjacent DNA sentences can be used in an overlapping way to create even more information. The DNA also has designed elements to be able to change these DNA sentences depending on a particular age or particular environment. On top of that, these DNA sentences produce proteins that can be folded differently in the 3D environment, allowing for even more information production. So as you can see, the amount of data present in the humble DNA sentence is enormous as it can be used in multiple ways. It is a highly advanced form of data compression. It is dynamic, self-regulating and multidimensional. Therefore, any change in one of the letters of the DNA sentence would almost certainly be a downhill mutation given that one letter can be involved in three or four different sentences. It is estimated by some that there are one million deleterious mutations to every beneficial mutation. Given that the majority of mutations represent information lost from the genomic encyclopedia, it would seem to be vital that these mutations would need to be selected out of the population to preserve the integrity of our DNA library. In our example of a genetically inherited predisposition to cancer that occurs after reproductive age, then there is no way to select against those mutations. One would have to screen children who are born with those mutations and tell them that we're unable to reproduce, not likely without a very authoritarian government. The problem with the majority of downhill mutations is that every mutation in isolation makes very little biological impact on reproduction. This graph demonstrates the population of mutations according to their selectability, with minus 1 being lethal and 0 being completely neutral. As it is obvious from the above discussion, most downhill mutations are near neutral and therefore virtually impossible to be removed from the human genetic pool by natural selection. This means that other non-heritable effects overshadow the near neutral effects of the downhill mutation. The first non-heritable factor is the environment. This includes accidental death, social upbringing, nutrition, war, famine, disease, etc. These factors are much more likely to affect reproductive rate than a change in one letter of a 6 billion letter encyclopedia. They act to negate the efforts of natural selection to select against a downhill mutation. As an analogy, natural selection has to determine the difference between two TVs, with one of those TVs having a missing pixel, and biological logarithmic dilution ensures that most mutations are much less obvious than that of one pixel loss to the image seen by the watcher. Note that a TV can have up to two 
million pixels, which pales in comparison to 6 billion DNA data points. Increasing reproductive fitness due to one mutation is so small that it is vastly overshadowed by accidental death not related to that mutation. The second non-heritable factor is heterosis or epistasis. This describes a process that in certain combinations genes work better than they would normally. Thus genes can work well in certain combinations but are undesirable all by themselves. Given that these gene combinations are not passed on as a whole but are broken up during the process of reproduction, this means that the undesirable gene can be passed on in a combination that does not work well in that particular combination. In that scenario, natural selection can easily be selecting for an unfavourable gene. The third factor is that most mutations involve recessive genes. This means that most mutations remain hidden because of the continual activity of the gene allele or copy. Therefore, a large mutational burden can be inflicted upon the DNA with even less effect upon the reproductive ability. The only outcome is continual loss of DNA integrity and stability. To select against downhill mutations, one needs maintenance of population size. This requires minimal number of mutations with minimal amount of non-heritable factors affecting reproduction. B. Clear identification and exclusion of mutants. This requires clear heritable changes caused by the mutation so they can be selected against prior to reproduction. Natural selection has extreme difficulty in selecting against multiple downhill mutations simultaneously. Not only that, these are mutations that it has great difficulty in distinguishing from the rest of the breeding population. These near neutral mutations act like the slow process of one's car rusting which happens one atom at a time. While tyres are unchanged, denser fix, colour is changed, the rusting process itself occurs underneath these selectable changes. While there are some mutations that will stand out from the rest of the crowd, i.e. those that cause perinatal death, the vast majority are essentially non-selectable. Natural selection works to an extent, but it is logically and mathematically obvious that it does not have the omnipotent power ascribed to it by the scientific minions. Population genetic theory makes some bold assumptions in order to avoid the problems described. 1. Each nucleotide can be inherited independently. 2. There is no such thing as epistasis. 3. It assumes infinite size of the population. 4. It assumes infinite time for selection to occur. 5. It assumes the ability to select for unlimited numbers of trays simultaneously. 6. It does not consider the near-neutral, non-selectable mutations. A bacterial culture is slightly different. It is a homogeneous population within a homogeneous environment which allows for efficient selection. They have simpler genomes, fewer mutations per genome, far fewer intragenomic interactions, and they have a very high rate of reproduction. That means that in bacteria there is a much smaller proportion of the genome that is near neutral and unselectable. And it also means a much greater percentage of the population can be removed if it develops a downhill mutation. If the process of mutation and natural selection cannot preserve the information already present within the DNA, how can it be relied upon to produce that complex information in the first place? Let's just concentrate now on the supposed ability that natural selection can create information. A mutation can change the information already present within the DNA. The amount of DNA can be increased by duplication. It is clear, therefore, that the amount of data within the DNA can be increased and it can be altered by mutation. However, data increase does not correlate with an increase in complex information. For example, if one duplicates a page in an encyclopedia, one hasn't actually increased the information present within the book, but has introduced a small level of confusion within the sequence of the book. This translates into a downhill change affecting the book. The effect of DNA, gene duplication upon the individual, is often near neutral and therefore not selected against. While there are beneficial mutations and duplications, the vast majority involve a loss of information. In order for a new function to occur within an organism, every step along the way requires a selectable advantage to the organism. If this is not the case, then there is no reason for that process to continue. For example, if a gene requires a thousand mutations, this number is generous, to change into another gene, 
which is required for a new function within the organism, then every single mutation along that path would necessarily have to be advantageous to the organism for it to continue along that path. This is practically, logically and mathematically ludicrous. The vast majority of those 1,000 mutations would have practically no beneficial effect on the organism and more likely would be a near neutral downhill mutation. The vast majority of these mutations would have to happen by chance and in sequence and not be directed by natural selection. Even if we assume that each mutation along that 1,000 mutation change is minimally beneficial to the organism, the majority would still be near neutral and therefore unable to be selected for against the background noise of random, non-heritable changes. The entire framework of the gene is defined by near neutrals and there is no way to either put them or hold them in place. But that is not the worst of it. Most new functions require multiple new genes to develop simultaneously in order for there to be any advantage to the organism. This is brilliantly explained using the concept of irreducible complexity coined by Behe. His example was that of a bacterial flagellum or motor which has 40 different protein parts. The motor is useless without all the parts to make it work and would actually be a burden upon the bacterium for most of the time that it took to form. Of course the scientific minions have railed against the clear logic of this and have used highly complicated arguments to hide the ramifications of this very simple problem. Like all machines, the sum total of the parts working together are insurmountably more advantageous than each individual part or the total number of parts working in separate places. To argue that the 40 different protein parts of the flagellum had separate functions and then will all abandon their separate functions in order to come together to form a bacterial flagellum is to overlook a multiplicity of logical errors. What possible other functions could they be? How would they benefit the organism? How would the first two parts come together, as that would be non-beneficial to the organism? How would they come together in the exact configuration that would allow the flagellum to eventually occur? What about the third part, the fourth part, and all the way to the twentieth protein part? We're not talking about joining different coloured Lego blocks, but highly complicated proteins that are folded into a specific configuration to interlink at specific sites and to perform a specific function. The fudge factor required is enormous. It is clear that the DNA cannot create endless new information as it keeps bumping into unselectable mutations that act as insurmountable barriers to gene progression. However, we do know that adaptive selection occurs. Adaptive selection acts on downhill mutations and on desired variation. That is variation that has already been programmed into the DNA. This can be seen with the multiplicity of recombination and segregation that can allow a single human couple to have a vast range of progeny based on the processes already designed within the human genome. Not only is DNA not omnipotent, but it is clear that it has a lifespan. The degradatory effect of additive downhill mutations not only leads to an increase in genetically inherited cancer and disease, but also heralds the end of human life as we know it.